Oh, Daniel, uh, good to join you on our, as I said, our, our mutual discussion of a complex socioeconomic topic, capital formation and capital uh, valuation. Carl, I couldn't be happier to be here with you. How many, how many back and forth conversations do we have? Did we have over? I don't know. It must have been uh, the the later half of of COVID, right? Probably, Probably about five about or six. Four, but but what struck me about them was their duration and depth. Uh, and you you've got a philosophy background, um, which a lot of people would think. Well, gee, that's not quite complementary to uh, economics uh, or, or, or valuation, but it's perfect. And you were, you know, exhibit A of, of, of how an inquiring mind can get into what seems to be an arcane topic um, and is in, in, in many respects. Um, but it, it touches on so many aspects of society and business and aspirations. So um, that's what's interesting about philosophy, I think, is when it engages the real world and and you're trying to uh, examine how something looks, you know, from different from different angles. That's what we'll be doing with capital formation. Yeah, absolutely. I I I wish that it that that the examination and that's a great word to use related to philosophy uh, to examine uh, to reflect to really think deeply about uh, what's going on. And in this particular situation, uh, when it comes to economics, I want to refer to a point. Uh, it was a debate that I saw with Steven Pinker and uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Okay. And quite honestly, I can't even remember what, what the debate is, was about. I think it had to do with something about whether we're in a, a state of flourishing or are things getting worse, this kind of thing. Right. And I remember one definition that kind of was like a flashbulb memory. And they were talking about economics. And I think it was Steven Pinker that said economics is really just the movement of people Um, and like the activity movement of people. Um, You know, the fact that we put uh, mathematical structures behind them and assign currencies and values and that type of thing. Really, it boils down with with the you know, the activities of populations. And uh, I think that's a really great starting point philosophically to, you know, to really ground the conversation. I, I think so. I'll, I'll add one little tidbit. Um, gross national product, GDP. It's a, it's a, it's a figure that, um, you know, you hear quoted all the time. It really has two drivers the population size, and how productive people are. So you could have a growing GDP, growing economy, just by adding people. They're not necessarily more productive. Um, uh, And the reason is that people need stuff. They they need food, shelter, clothing. They, They buy services. So if you add more people to a an economy, you're contributing to its growth just by virtue of that. It's not all about productivity, but productivity can take a stable population and, and, and create more demand for goods and services. Mm. Carl, you tell me, I'm going to ask you a question and I'm going to bring in the concept of climate change for a minute um, because you, you mentioned that, that, GDP word, and that's the but that's the trigger word for me when it comes uh, to our economies, and uh, and and I really closely associate it with climate change. So, how comfortable are you talking about climate change, or even having the conversation move towards? Because it, look, we we started this conversation. We said we we're going to talk about decentralized currencies, right? We we're going to we were going to talk about like Bitcoin and, uh, and uh, well, and other such, you know, technologies, right? So do you want to talk about the Bitcoin, the decentralized currencies? Should we jump into that first? Or do you want to talk about climate change? Let's talk about climate change. Okay, um, okay. 
Well, I guess I have to ask you the question, right? <laughs> well, you can go ahead. Okay. And, and so I think that there's a fundamental issue with nations focusing uh, around that GDP marker as an indicator of economic health. I mean, it just, it's antithetical with the, um, with the environment uh, and the drawdown of resources, right? So the scale at which and necess- necessity of, of the drawdown is, is definitely something that we could talk about. But I'm envisioning a different type of model, Carl. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hey, it is no problem. So I'm envisioning a different type of model where GDP is not the central focus. That production model isn't the central focus. Um, something that's more compatible with uh, the biodiversity of the planet, right? And so, are we headed in that direction, right? Um, or is it sort of business as usual? Hmm. So that's a nice, easy philosophical question to start off with. Um, it, 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 it reminds me of uh, my favorite Star Trek movie. I think it was called First Contact. And uh, in it, um, the crew of the Star Trek star, uh, uh, starship, the Enterprise, go back in time to and, and have a chance to intervene to change the pro- trajectory of, of uh, Earth's future um, uh, by making sure that uh, they have success in launching a rocket that goes into to space and is seen by a traveling spaceship from uh, planet Vulcan and they realize here's an advanced people and it's the start of inter- intergalactic uh, interaction on a positive scale. And, and the Cleons, in an attempt to reset history, don't want the U.S. or, or, or the world to um, make that presence known because they want the resources that um, Earth has. So at one point, there's a scene where uh, so, somebody from the from Earth, in back in time, is up on on the uh, on the Enterprise, and just wowed by how extensive the the spacecraft is, and asked, "How much did this cost?" And the captain um, says, "Well, we we don't we don't deal with money anymore. We don't value things that way. That was old history." So, you know, the idea that. Um, the, the future way of measuring value uh, will be different from what we've done in the past is sort of a beguiling one, but um, we haven't quite figured out how to make that bridge, if you will, like the bridge between Oakland and San Francisco you see in my background. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but, that's, a, that's very complex, right? Because currencies go and, and the market systems go back you know, pre-Hellenic time period, right? So almost with the birth of culture, it's very, very difficult to imagine something um, that that doesn't have some sort of interchange of of uh, of currency. Exactly right. Um, at, at the same time, um, you know, when I was writing the book, the Fair Share Model, um, and musing at some of the the macroeconomic issues. Well, there's some noise back there. Um, when I was musing about some of these issues, I thought, well, the epic struggle of the 20th century turned out to be a struggle of uh, would, would the commanding heights of the world economies be controlled by markets or government, central planning? Mm-hmm. And we, we saw how, um, you know, that played out in the Cold War and you know, it had, had risk of, of exploding into uh, uh, much dire, more dire consequences. Um, it, clearly, it's worse than probably we, we know because of all the 
chemical and radio radioactive material that's been created um, and lying around. But I thought, you know, in the beginning of um, the 20th century, if you were to go around World War I and ask a person on the street, hey, what do you think the epic struggle of this century is going to be? It's unlikely they would have phrased it that way because they didn't know. I mean, the Russian Revolution didn't occur until 1917. So the idea of a Cold War struggle between market economies and, and centralized planning um, hadn't ripened. If, you, if yeah. you were to go to somebody, so therefore, if you go to someone now in the 21st century and say, hey, what do you think the epic struggle of, of the 21st century will be? We, we may not quite get it, but I think climate uh, change is obviously going to be a, a, a major one. Um, and, and, and it could, could also well be uh, struggled with uh, bioterrorism, uh, nuclear terrorism, or, or accidental warfare. But um, the epic struggle from an economic standpoint for this century, I think is going to be, can the benefits of capitalism be more broadly shared and realized? more fairly realized. So you juxtaposition that with the environmental one, and you see, you know, this this centuries old mechanism of how we value things uh, and, and conduct commerce is gonna collide with our ability to preserve the earth uh, and the climate and, 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 and maintain um, good living conditions for all the creatures. Um, it's a real dilemma. We haven't figured it out. We can we can we can uh, capture moments of the thought and use them in movies like Star Trek, but um, we we don't really have a mechanism for figuring out an alternative way to value things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, on a smaller time scale, your innovation isn't quite so ideological. Um, I think. Um, I'm going to, I really like the format of this, uh, of this conversation. And I'd like to continue this, um, you know, throughout our ongoing and, you know, regular series is that we can bring it really wide and have a philosophical discussion. And I really appreciated that, Carl. That was really, really good. I think that'll show not only the listeners um, uh, something really valuable, but then provide a, a depth to who Carl is. Um, beyond, uh, you know, the book cover that, that you, that you have. Right. And I think, I think now what I'm seeing with authors is that promoting an authentic self, somebody that is doing something more than the, the, the promotionary, um, activities of, of, of their titles, uh, that's who I want to buy a book from, right? Like if, if I like you, and your personality and your points and the way you think, which, um, which, which I do, Carl, it's, uh, unfortunately you've already sent me a free copy of the book, so I can't buy another one unless, <laughs> right. You got but, his friends. <laughs> yeah. I can buy one for my friends. Right. So I've got to, I've got to dig deep and go into the, you know, the, cause there's some serious, there's some serious uh, research. I think you must've done for this book. Um, yeah, you know, I I I, I delve into it probably uh, you know about an hour or two a week, and um, what I'm struggling in in the book is 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 the the great depth of examples um, and and very apparent research that that you've done, and so the reason why I pull back is because I'm trying to I'm trying to reflect on how I can apply it right and. Yeah. So we yeah. talked about the application of the model too, even even related to uh, my media company and Planksip, right? So we've talked about that. But this is this is what I'm doing. Is it's it's a slower read for me, not because I can't read quickly. I do read a lot, but it, I think it's it's um, the kind of content that I'm not used to seeing um, because it is so ex extensive and it's. Um, 
very much speaks to somebody who's in the IPO world. You know, I, I appreciate you saying what you did, Daniel, um, because it, it sort of reflects my thinking, my, my hope when I was writing. Um, this is such, you know, I, I, I think of capital formation, or I've come to think of it, as sort of like dropping a little pebble into a pond and, and seeing the ripples that come out. Um, and rather than try to say, you know, here, here, here's, a, here's the top 10 things you should do or, or um, somehow a reduction, I really like the idea of, of going broad and shallow um, mm -hmm. to, to invite a reader to draw a connection between the topic, capital structures, and various different things that they, they're they already aware of, but now maybe they're, they're drawing the line a little bit more clearly. And it does invite self-reflection. It, 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 it's not really material that, um, well, there, there are, there's material that you can go through pretty quickly and get, get some key ideas about securities law and, um, evaluation and how, how it works. But when you get to the philosophical application of these ideas, um, it, it really does just invite thought. So I'm not surprised by what you said. It, it's actually what I hope for. But, but as a mercantile uh, author, I probably would say, ah, why did you do it that way? But that's my... <laughs> No, but it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm no stranger to wanting to write for the, um, for, for, for the best ultimate purpose. And if, if that, we were just talking about that, is the best ultimate, uh, the best purpose for you to see um, a mad rush in book sales and then, um, you know, not as much long-term uh, application, right? I mean, it, throughout history, how many posthumous authors um, struggled almost to a point of starvation uh, only now to have their books, uh, you know, form a foundation of, of, of economic reality. We can only, we, you know, the, the person that comes to my mind when I think of that is, is Karl Marx. And, uh, you know, I mean, he is the juxtaposition against capital in uh, uh, e every academic institution that, you know, they have at least part of him in the curriculum. And, uh, you know, we can't say that Carl, for example, will, will make that type of, um, you know, uh, sort of status over time. But you never know the way history, because that points what you said before. You never know what and how, how history will unravel, right? You're, you're right. Um you know, your, your evo invocation of, of Marx is sort of interesting to me for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, you know, he wrote, he and uh, Engel wrote Das Kapital uh, around 1850 or so. So the dawn of the Industrial Age, and, and you can sense that there was this, this struggle between the interest of labor and capital that were were clear, and you know, the, the, it wasn't that long before that you had um, the formation of the United States, um, which was an, another kind of experiment where you know ideas had been brewing for decades, almost you know, nearly a hundred years in terms of alternative forms of government to feudal dynastic rule. And, and so you had philosophers like uh, Rousseau talking about um, uh, checks and balances, breaking down power into uh, functions like legislative, judicial, executive. You know, the thing where, where before that, they were all wrapped into a, a, a solitary being. 
and and the idea that you could break these components down and spread spread you had different interests, different functions that of of government that had to be performed. And how would you balance? How would you have checks and balances? Um, these were things that animated a lot of philosophical discussions in um, the 1700s. Then the United States was formed when it broke away from England. And its first form of trying to get it right, the Articles of Confederation, didn't really work very well. And about 20 years later, you know, they, they redid it with the uh, U.S. Constitution. And to get that approved, you needed 10, 10 amendments right away. And, and there's a long history of amendments being tr tried to tinker with Im improving how this complex process works. You have the same thing going on in economics with the relationship of labor and capital. Um, um, you know, it, it, it took 70 years or so uh, before between the time that Das Kapital came out and when the Russian Revolution took place. One of my uh, favorite quotes in the book actually is from Vladimir Lenin. Hmm. And it's, uh, decades can go by and nothing happens. Weeks can go by and decades happen. Hmm. <clears throat> so, the Fair Share Model is really a, a social movement book. Mm. Um, yeah. It's going to take time. And, and, and um, you know, I make a reference in the early chapters to uh, a movie that came out <clears throat> in the 1970s called Network. Did you ever see it? Yeah. Yeah, you remember that. It was a, the, the, the news business was changing from straight news to entertainment. And, and uh, uh, the iconic uh, newscaster who's upset by all of this has a scene where he's uh, extorting his uh, viewers. He'd be basically saying, hey, I understand the things that are, are making everybody upset. And, and we don't know exactly what the solution would be. But if you want to change things, you have to first get mad. So I want you to get up out of your chair, go to the window, open it up, stick your head out, and yell, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Um, in a way, that's really all I'm trying to do, um, is to get people interested in saying, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Mm, interesting. And, and I, I, you know, the Fisher model is one way to deal with that balancing of interest between capital and labor in startups that raise public venture capital. But my goodness, this is, this is a big palette uh, that, and, 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 and a big screen where there's going to be lots of ideas on how to do it. And so this is just an entry point for a broader discussion that actually has been animating human societal discussions for hundreds of years, whether it's yeah. economics or, or government. So, Carl, let me ask you this on the fair share model. I've got, a, I've got an assumption based off of what I've read. And the, the thing is, this is the interesting thing about the two minds and how we are actually able to come together. I mean, I bring whatever experience an educational background that I have, as well as how I project into the future, um, where and how I access, uh, I calculate risk, for example, computational sort of uh, ability with with um, with that that gray matter in my in my in my cranium, um, you know, and and you're really the same thing. Uh, that's something that we have in common. But my my point here is on. On, on the fair share model in particular is I would say what happens or the way I'm perceiving the fair share model is that its biggest fundamental value is that it performs better and will, it's a better alternative in times of greater 
uncertainty. So where, what I mean by that, and then I'll let, I'll let you, you know, just, you know, bounce it around for um, maybe you envisioned it this way or not, but it's, it's my one single biggest takeaway because the valuation isn't projected so far into the future. It's projected um, in sequential stages, uh, ladders, if you will, like sequential sort of rungs in a ladder. Um, and so from that standpoint, it seems um, to be that particular solution to even that, that the quote, the Lenin quote that you just mentioned, that there may be periods of time in, um, in an entity's growth, and I mean in an economic entity's growth, where there's stagnation and then there's growth and then there's a pullback and then there's growth. But these, these types of nonlinear sort of um, growth patterns, um, they are really facilitated and um, they, they are, they, they're, you can take advantage of them with something like the fair share model. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. Um, I, I think an, an interesting analogy or useful analogy is um, growth as a, hum, a, a, as a human being. And, and, the, and the essence of, of, of the valuation challenge is, is timing. Not so much what do we value, but um, when. Um, in a conventional capital structure, you, you, you put a value on future events and you discount it back and say, this is what something's worth now. But our ability to forecast that is notoriously bad. Um, and what the Fisher model does instead say, hey, don't try to assess a value on future performance when equity capital uh, is being raised. Um, rather, just come up with uh, agreement on how to define performance and how to reward it. So what you're really having to say, in essence, is um, what do I want? How important is it to me? And that's not so easy. Um, you know, if, if you were to think about your kids and say, well, you know, I want you to be a good human being. I want you to be productive. I want you to be successful, however you define that, um, or they define it. It's, it's easy to say that as, as a sentiment. But if you were to try to break that down and say, okay, you know, um, you, 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 you're, you're going to get some rewards for being a civil person, for being curious, for getting good grades, or, uh, attending school, um, being kind to others, whatever. Um, it, it, it's a little bit like, you know, you take a, a telescope and we use it to see things distant in the future close. And if you flip a telescope and you look through it, you, you're seeing things that are close look distant. It's the, it's the change in perspective. And that's sort of what the Fisher model does. It, it says, hey, you can't really predict how well this company is going to do, um, what it will be worth down the road. but um why not why not try a different approach where you say simply hey if you if you do these things this is this is the reward that's going to go to to labor the employees which includes the founders um so it's 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 a different approach to, it doesn't it doesn't change the, com the complexity i guess part of what um um is, is the issue here is complexity. Yeah. We can't get rid of complexity because we're dealing with lots of different interests at a present time. We're dealing with different vectors in time, now versus the future. These are complex things. Now, conventionally, we've, we have developed ideas to kind of reduce that complexity. 
And so we, 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 we think we've simplified things, but all we do is really have a tradition. And I, I say in the book, there's a formula for capital structures, and it's basically um, one part technical, two parts tradition. So the idea is that there are different ways to deal with complexity. There's different ways to deal with situations. But, you know, if you, you have a well-traveled path, and it's sometimes hard to imagine a different one. But a different one could open up some new opportunities. And that's what the fair share model does. It basically offers up an opportunity to um, strike a different type of balance between capital and labor. Yeah, no kidding, no kidding. <clears throat> Let me go back to Marx just for a minute. I want to see if you see uh, um, uh, something that, it, it, it's the thing is, is I almost feel like when I explain this uh, in terms of, of Marx, it's um, it's met with abrasion in, in uh, institutions, for example. I don't know why, um, you know, people in, in, in the, the academic institutions really push back on these uh, types of things. But what, how do you see um, the, do you see this? Look, here's how I see the system as, as being different. And you brought up the point of time where um, uh, the industrial revolution uh, was first starting to emerge and the real disparity and the separation between labor um, and capital. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's quite what's going on in our, if that's the, if it's the same picture of what's going on in today's reality. And, and, and here's my point is that we seem to have more of a consumptive based model, right? I mean, I know there's a lot of production, there's a lot of energy companies and there's a lot of haves and there's a lot of have nots. But I think the difference is, is that um, the main push it appears to me comes from people that don't have that wish they had, you know, something like a Jeff Bezos account <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> this, this type of thing, right? And I just think that the nature of the characteristics of the capital versus labor is just different from that period of time in uh, the, the, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Do you see any differences between then and now? Um, does that make any sense? Huh, I think there's always going to be differences. It's, um the similarities, though. I mean, it, 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 if if you look at how wealth concentration has um, increased in recent decades, um, that's not so dissimilar from the industrial age. Mm. Um, if you think about how. I, and I, I think this is a, is a factor that animates a lot of our political um, discussions. Um, a diminished optimism in in the future by uh, in in a, on the part of people who rely on the return on labor for their for the most part, as opposed to the return on capital. Hmm. That seems pretty similar. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah. The, there's enough similarities. I I, I think, uh, in the words of a professor I had um, in college, same girl, different dress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, think about what both of you, both you and I do as I guess we would be the bourgeoisie class, right? So both you and I are, um, you know, we're, we're not in control of, of um, a tremendous amount of power or influence. Um, my labor is a different form of labor. It's an intellectual labor, which is really, is that bestowed upon me by a combination of the actual working labor class and the upper echelons of, 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 of wealth? Probably, right? I mean, 
you know, it's, it's like an emergent phenomenon that we are able to do what we do um, in, in the way that we're able to do it without that difference or that stratification would, would our identities basically fizzle, fizzle away? Well, you know, perhaps we would be poets or philosophers in 200 years ago, um, drinking wine and eating cheese, um, but we're worrying about where it was going to come from. <laughs> I don't know. Um, um, you know, the population's a lot bigger in the world, um, and how we communicate um, intensifies uh fractures in perspective um so yeah it's it, it's um it's just it's different but it's still the same in, in a number of respects i think i've saw i thank you for that carl i've, I've kind of I've, I've kind of softened with my and I, I think that's really helpful because you 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 actually have a a good way of of um like i have to commend you for your critical thinking on on that sort of front because I did I have this this you know this this sort of pull this this uh, questioning that is what is the difference what is you know what what is the difference between the two ages and is it significant enough that you know we can draw some 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 differences some meaningful differences between the two ages um, undoubtedly it exists but. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not, again, I'm not entirely sure what to do about it. Now, there's, um, there is a concept I read about why a centralized um, uh, a political system, uh, why a centralized political system actually won out over the decentralized uh, political system. And I, and I mean, like, economically. So if you, if you look at, uh, the 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 Soviet power and that centralized control of power versus the uh, market driven it's just so much more efficient right it it's just and so this this was the thesis of the book that I I read and that's that's essentially it wasn't ideological it had nothing to do with that right it had nothing to do with my system is better than yours because it's a better idea it's it. I mean, it does in a way, but it's it's um, it's a better idea because it's more efficient, right? It's just more efficient. So I would I would hedge and put my money um, towards an idea in the future that was actually a really efficient idea, right? And a really efficient economic model, as opposed to something that was less efficient. Um, what what do you think about the efficiency of the model that you're putting forward in the book? Um, I think it 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 highlight it highlights it. Well, cup couple points. I I I think that the point you made about uh, centralized planning versus market economies. The 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 enemy of both in all society, in a way, is corporatism. You know the the concentration of interest um, that happens in political parties and in, in, in uh, business scale, labor unions. Um, um, it, it, it's where groups of shared interest. Um, have an interest in blocking the the performance, if you will, of other other groups, and so that's sort of a a human type of condition, which um, market economies have more opportunity to undo, just because there's so many so many crabs in the pot trying to pull, you know. <laughs> pull on the others, if you will. It's, it's, it's highly competitive. Whereas planned economies, the corporatism can seep in and 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 be more difficult to to challenge because by their nature they're they're creating a stasis, um a stability in how things are. And 
I suppose in some respects, we, we all long for, for that as long as we're a beneficiary of it. But in a dynamic society, um, there's this turnover of who, who's on top all the time. And um, I, I think the success of market economies is that it probably did a better job at deterring or countering corporatism than planned economies. Yeah. I like um, your broad use of corporatism there, right? Because it's any, any group that amalgamates around common interest and then, uh, you know, fends off outsiders, very tribal type of community, yeah. right? Yeah. It, 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 it's trying to, uh, promote the interest of a, of a of cohorts as opposed to the general creating opportunity for all and and you know having having an open field of competition if you will yeah but to your question um, does the Fisher model um, enhance competition was that how you put it efficiency actually efficiency. so I'm yeah, so if we look at the traditional, let's and let's be a little, let's be specific because we've been pretty broad. So if we look at the um, uh, the IPO life cycle and efficiency of that to market, does the fair share model offer a greater or lesser degree of efficiency? And it's it's fine if there's not an intuitive answer to that, but I'm I'm just curious if there's if there's something that pops to your into your mind about that. Efficiency seems uh, is an interesting word. Um, it it's, can imply simplicity, uh, directness, um, but also more effectiveness. And 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 so this, this, it, we keep going back to this issue of complexity. Um, to in improve effectiveness, sometimes things need to be complex. And the question becomes, who who's the beneficiary of the complexity? Um, I would say that the Fisher model is very consistent with efficiency from the standpoint of giving a further further incentive for investors to write a check to the company when they have an initial public offering. Yeah, I think it, it, it should widen the pool. Because mm -hmm. it's a deal. It, yeah. yeah it, would, would you rather buy a, a, uh, a big screen TV for $1,500 or $200? Well, say, hey, that's a simple decision. That's, the fair share model makes that IPO price. It gives incentive for the company to set it really, really low. Yeah. Crazy Eddie low. Our evaluations are insane. So it it it, in, <laughs> it ex increases the uh incentive for investors to invest. Um it also increases the incentive for employees to perform the way investors are hoping. Hmm. Because first off it, it decouples voting power from wealth. It, 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 it allows them to operate as, you know, as two separate things. But uh, in the fair share model, a, a well-performing team of employees can end up owning much more of the wealth they create with their labor using investor capital than a venture capitalist would allow. That's that's amazing, Carl. That's really innovative. I think. I think we gotta when we're uh, in, in this series because we're gonna do this once a month. I think we should keep bringing that point up. I think that's that's the that's that's what we stand up and yell when we open the window. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I I think there is part of me that thinks we need that a catchphrase for that. Yeah, we need a catchphrase for that, but. Um, I think well, that, I wish that's what it is. And, and, and any social change, you, you have to try to figure out how is, um, who's the beneficiary, who's the loser. 
Mm-hmm. Can, can can you can you get can you provide something um, for for those who uh, y- you want to join in and, and and get enough of them that you get a consensus? Um, you know, a parliamentary uh, form of government. You're, you're ruling a ruling group, um, and for those who are losers. You, you at least want to have a philosophical argument that's strong enough to say, well, you know, this is the right thing to do. And um, I do that in the fair share model too. Well, I, I, I'm, I think what I'm going to actually do myself, I think we should, um, you know, we're going to segment parts of this uh, video. And I think that we really should advocate for the, the fair share portion of the fair share model, because there's a real compelling social piece to this um, narrative as well. Um, the interesting just, thing that... What, yeah, just what, what does fairness mean? Is, yeah, what is, does is fairness mean? Yeah. We'll, we'll have to examine. Yeah, what does fairness mean? And I think the, the onus is on the small business uh, uh, as well to understand, you know, how do they get to that um, sole proprietor? Anybody can kind of put an open sign on their virtual window um, go to business, so to speak. How do you get to the point where you're even in the realm of thinking of an IPO, even if it is using the, the the fair share model, right? So there's a tremendous amount of innovation and willpower from from you know from from society, but they need to have some mechanism to get into that IPO uh, position, right? And I mean, so I want to use Planksip as an example. Um, you know, we're not we're not a big publishing company. Um, we're uh, a rather small media outlet, and we focus on philosophy and culture. So we don't have um, a revenue model that relies on and on any corporate advertising. Um, the model is really self sustaining by the membership, right? So um, this is something that you know. I mean, it's it's not skyrocketing growth, um, although it doesn't mean that we can't have a skyrocketing number of members join in based on the concept and the entry point is fairly low. So I really like the concept and the possible, you know, overlap with growth and using the fair share model. If, if, if we could use some sort of a catalyst to get to the point where I'm sitting down with the lawyer saying, okay, you know, next week the IPO launches and here's, here's the model we want to use, right? That's the question I'm, trying to figure out how do I get from point A to point B? Um, well, yeah, so just, just, uh, 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 let me say this about that. Um, an IPO is, is, is the first availability of uh, the stock to be sold to anybody, average people, public offering. Um, you could structure it with a conventional approach or the fair share model approach. Um, what the the difference there is is when is the value of future performance going to be? When will investors be paying for it? Will they pay for it up front, which is the conventional model, or down the road through through performance uh, as as employees positions? convert into tradable stock. Um, <clears throat> the key thing is, do you have people who want to invest? Mm. There's a difference between how to structure and how to invest. And maybe a structure can encourage people to want to invest. And people basically have to like the business, the the the, the, the the principles involved, uh, the idea, what it's trying to accomplish. If if they like the plank shift, I, plank shift idea, um, and they like you, and they and they they want to support what you're doing, I would say that the fair share model would increase your odds of two things: one, attracting inv- more investors. To actually write a check, right. But more importantly, it would enhance your ability to deliver performance down the road because 
you would have this huge pool of performance stock that's voting but doesn't trade. And you could use it in creative ways to enhance your performance, to expand your membership, to, to uh, encourage people to contribute content, mm. to create a platform <laughs> for philosophical dialogue uh, yeah. on, on the internet. I, I'm sure there's a good case that an appealing case that um, for that for a lot of people, because we have too much darn trivia, <laughs> not yeah. enough, not enough uh, more complex thought that's a, that's available, and and so it, it, in a way, I don't know. You're 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 gonna. It sounds like you you could be. Trying to create the the uh, essence of what we had in in the U.S. the national public radio, you know, a sort of a volunteer alternative news network to begin with, um, and and you find your way by by getting content, and then there could be uh, some deep pocketed philanthropic type people who decide, hey, I like what you're doing, and I want to support it. But except they're not just philanthropically uh, motivated. Maybe they see what you're doing as possibly building a, a valuable business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, well, so let me ask you this. I want to be creative with the idea. It might be too far out, but we have the, the, the $101 um, membership uh, that we have for members when they sign up. Right now, it it's it, it's free or it's a hundred dollars a month or a thousand and ten a year. I mean, playing on the binary one hundred one or one hundred one, <laughs> right? So the one and zero. So, anyways, we've got this. And besides, the ninety nine dollars a month is too cliche, right? So we we're we're we're, we're fairly expensive, but we provide more hands on uh, uh, offerings to the to the members. And depending on what's right for the members, it's there's there's a lot of variability in that in that um in that membership model but here's the question is that what if if somebody feel if if, if a, a philanthropist decided that they wanted to um invest in the company and the individual units um you know say for example shares that were available were also were all available in increments of 101 dollars a month i just like how that matches up with the membership concept, right? Now, could I do something where I said $101 a month is one unit, um, you know, that's what it costs per unit. And then the, um, the the philanthropist comes and says, okay, that's great. I'll, I'll, I'll get 100 of those. So now the model is that with 100 of those, 100 of those infused sort of dollars, we actually go and bring um, value to people who normally wouldn't be able to afford the the membership, right? Is that, do you see that as being a valuable <clears throat> um, service? Because we're actually bringing people in, right? But they're not really paid members. We use that philanthropic um, mechanism to then pay for people's memberships, right? Now they're all creating content and, you know, developing things from there. And, the net result from all of that increased membership then filters into, you know, it's all about numbers. It's all a numbers game these days, right? With with you know how many members you can get into your into your collective. Well, you've got sort of two different elements there. You've got revenue versus equity. Revenue is hopefully a recurring thing, the membership fee type things. Um, uh, equity is like a lump sum amount of cash that um, you're, you're not providing a good or a service for. All you're doing is providing um, an ownership interest. Um, philanthropy is a little bit, I guess, of an odd, it isn't something that I dealt with in the book because it's not so much um, an issue in business people generally when they give something they want something back of value so a customer wants a good or a service uh, an investor wants um, an ownership position or a security interest 
in in the business. Um, if it's a cause, um, the contributor wants a good feeling to, to feel like they're doing something good, they're contributing to something good, and not necessarily wanting more than that in return. But in terms of um, <clears throat> what you described for plank zip, um, you you could use the fair share model to raise capital that has an ownership interest. Mm -hmm. You could also allocate some of that. You know, I let's say you needed twenty million dollars, uh, and you could get twenty million dollars um, from various deep pocketed philanthropic type people let's say no let's say they're investors they, they see the 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 possibility well you you might say to them hey um commit to 15 in this ipo but for 30 60 90 days you want to sell the remaining five million in increments of 100 uh share lots if you do that, if you sell $5 million worth of stock in increments of 100 share lots, you're going to end up with 50,000 additional shareholders you start, So, who provided 5 million bucks. And you have 15 from the others, you got your 20 million. Mm -hmm. um, 50,000 more shareholders is a good thing because, first off, it, it qualifies you for a better trading exchange. One of the criteria that exchanges have is um, how many shareholders do you have? See, 50,000 is better than 5,000. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But more to the point, because your IPO investors are not paying for future performance when they're investing, um, they're getting a deal. They're, they're getting that $1,500 big screen TV for 200 bucks. Yeah. They are, there's a glee factor in that. They're getting a deal. Um, why is it a deal? Because the presumption is the secondary market will recognize that your the value of your business is, is greater than it is and the price will go, go up in the secondary market. But, um, you know, 50,000 people who are positioned to make money as your company is, is building its services because they, they got such a good deal. Um, they are incentivized to tell friends and family. You are, are accomplishing a marketing goal via distribution of your stock. Normally, to achieve a marketing goal, you have to raise capital or have money to spend on marketing expense. Yeah. Here, you've accomplished something without incurring an expense. It's, it's, it's a byproduct of how you allocated your stock. But yeah. since, since you're interested ultimately in developing a network, um, a broad-based audience for your content, you're furthering your strategic goals as well. Mm. So um, I wonder if I <clears throat> if I could just make the um, if if I could somehow make every member a, a shareholder, and that's my diversified pool. I mean, I ideally wanted to have uh, a membership. That gets complicated. It I gets mean, complicated. You need to yeah. talk to a, a, um, a securities attorney in Canada, but. Um, mm. Um, and generally regulators, you know, like things, yeah, traditional yeah. and clear cut, yeah, and straightforward. Um, and the more it's, it's, it's sort of like you're mixing the fresh water of, of, of membership with the salt water of um equity, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want to do that. <laughs> we don't want to do that. No, we don't it, want to do that. It, it's possible. There's there's ways, perhaps it could happen, but but you do want to have 
some bifurcation there where somebody could be a member, a customer, and not be an owner, and mm. vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Yeah. No, that's a that's that's a great strategy, and I think that it comes with, like you said, the social message of something that's. Um, uh, it, I, so I'm looking at it this way, because there's um, greater stability in numbers, the market values a, a higher, an increased number of investors, it, it, there's a higher valuation just in that structure. And so that makes that makes the, the larger investors, it makes it more attractive for larger investors, just simply because of the fact that there's a um, a pool of investors that have bought in at a um, a lower increment. I suppose it's almost like you could you could imagine it like a class B and C share or something, right? So the class B shares are worth a thousand dollars a share, and the class C shares are worth a hundred dollars a share, right? Is that would that be fair in a way to think of it that way? Yeah, you're making a difference. I mean, you could. Um The you you can dual class or multi class capital structures are required to introduce complexity into a capital structure because a multi class capital structure allows a company to treat different groups of shareholders differently. Um. You've, you've, you've seen in the last 15, 20 years um, uh, in the United States, a growth, in, at least in the tech sector, um, of companies going public with a multiple class structure. So you know, Google did it. Uh, they, the founders had shares uh, that had 10 times the voting power. Uh, it got really ridiculous a few years ago with um, uh, a company called Snap. Snap had an IPO that raised a lot of money, and they were non-voting shares, hmm. zero vote. Um, Alibaba, the biggest IPO in history, I think, uh, it also offered shares that were essentially non-voting. So point is that um, you, you can use creativity in capital structures to accomplish a number of different things. Um, and, that, and that's why I say in the book, think of capital structures as art. Mm. Art is um, a human expression of something, beauty, conflict, uh, points of interest, perspective. Um, and, and I, and I, I make the point about, um, how I experience art in a museum, you know, I'll stand back, I'll go to the side, I'll go in close, I'll read the placard. And over time, I start to sense things about who these companies feel are, are important. What's the rel relative ranking? What do they think of in public investors versus the private investors? And it's like any expression of human um, values. Um, the more you see, the more you discern. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and so um, you could use the palette of a capital structure to um, do some interesting things with planship in terms of not only how you're, how you're raising the capital, but how you're providing incentives and rewards. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I could even make uh, the, the lower class shares are the only ones that vote. I could reverse that. that that's a statement in itself. It almost makes it more like a, I guess like an angel investing model, I suppose. Right. But uh, uh, you know, the, the, the fundamental agreement you need um, is people interested in writing yeah. a book. Um, and, and, and then 
you, you need you need to structure the offering in a way that is consistent with um, the rules in the jurisdiction that you're you're raising. Um, but yeah, for for the for the fair share model, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I went to a um, event on crowdfunding, a panel discussion at Stanford Law School last year, and one of the panelists was a uh, commissioner at the Securities and Exchange Commission. And I described the fair share model to him mm -hmm. and showed, showed him the book. And he said, that's great. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because it was offering public investors more value than they would normally get. It, 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 it was a better deal for them. They were less yeah. likely to, to lose money, more money likely to make money. Uh, and it hasn't been done yet. No one's tried it, but it shows the art par part of it. The, 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 you know, may, maybe I'm Salvador Dali going into a, you know, <laughs> a room full of painters making, uh, you know, customary paintings. I'm looking at yeah. it differently. I love it, Carl. I love it, actually. And uh, I mean, we should, uh, I think we're kind of about where we should be on our, our first episode, right? So we can maybe, you know, summarize our last points. And, uh, but I, I do, I'm really thankful for, you know, having you, uh, uh, you know, share this time with me. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing this on a, a regular basis. It's uh, been really nice to connect with you. Same here, Daniel. I love the questions. Yeah, well, we'll just keep digging into it. Unfortunately, we didn't really get into the decentralized currencies. So I think that'll be, I think, let's agree that that's, that's what we talk about on the next, uh, on the next episode. There's always something. There's always something. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, and uh, until next time. Bye. -bye.